Welcome back. Well, Michael Barber is an assistant professor of instructional technology and education evaluation and research at Wayne State University and joins me on the phone from Windsor, Ontario. Michael, how are things today? Oh, not too bad. It's sunny and plus nine up here. Ah, well, that's not a bad thing, is it? No, not for the second week of or first week of February. Yeah, no. I'd take sunny and plus nine any day. Tell me a little bit more about Wayne State University. Um, it's actually a, an urban university in downtown Detroit, uh, located uh, right in the middle of the, the Cass Corridor, which is actually known as being, I guess, one of the, the rougher areas of town, although it's also in the midtown area, which is where a lot of the... Um, art institutions and, and cultural institutions are in the city, like the Detroit Institute of the Arts, the Historical Museum, Science Center, that kind of thing. Okay. Now, you've done a lot of research and did some publication, correct? Yes. Tell me about some of that. Um, well, basically, the area that I research the most is, is K-12 online learning, and, and being a Canadian, I noticed I, I followed my fellow Newfoundlander, uh, Scott Sims, here this morning. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of that research has focused upon Canada, and in particular, Atlantic Canada, specifically Newfoundland. And, uh, um, you know, I listened to your, your show last week or the week before, and I, I heard Dr. Bennett on, and uh, he has a recent report out which uh, talks about K-12 online learning in Canada. And um, I think draws some conclusions that um, I believe are probably music to the ears of the sponsors of the report, but I'm not sure if they accurately portray uh, the situation that we have in Canada. Okay, tell me about the sponsors of the report. Um, well, the organization that sponsored the report is basically interested in providing essentially choice or, or opportunity to parents beyond the public system. So looking at private education, charter schooling that we see in Alberta, and for that matter, in the U.S., and um, basically anything that, that works within the system. So if you look at, say, centralized control by ministries of education or um, any sort of influence exerted by teachers' unions are seen as basically bad. Okay. So you feel as though perhaps his... Uh, when he was uh, delivering his information in the report and during interviews like the one that he did with myself, his view may be skewed by that prejudice, perhaps? Um, well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that he's writing necessarily for his sponsors. I, I honestly believe that, that Mr. Bennett holds many of these views as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think he's sort of, you know, being bought and paid for. I, I think that ideologically himself, I, I think he agrees with, with many of these positions. And, you know, when we look at, at the available data that we have here in Canada, and for that matter, what we've seen happen in the United States where private investment in public education, particularly when it comes to distance education and online learning, um, hasn't really shown to be all that favorable. Um, you know, the data doesn't support a lot of the conclusions that are being drawn here. Right. Okay. Tell me more what you think. What's your idea and how does it con or ideas or, or conclusions and how do they contrast to what perhaps uh, Mr. Bennett spoke of? Um, well, one of the, I guess, the, the, the first things are Mr. Bennett puts out, or Dr. Bennett puts out the idea that um, Canada is falling behind, that we're lagging somehow with the United States. And um, I, I disagree with that. I think that in Canada we're actually doing quite well. We've, we've been an early adopter of many of these initiatives. Um, proportionally, depending on the numbers you look at, we're, you know, keeping pace. Um, if you look, for example, at the Department of Education numbers in the United States and use that as your official tally, Canada actually proportionally is a little ahead of, of where the Americans are. Now, if you use some of the trade representative numbers, and, you know, let's face it, these are corporations that are designed to set out a blueprint for other corporations on how to make money within public education, their numbers show that there's probably twice as many students in the U.S. as what the Department of Education has. Um, you know, so I, I think we're leading, and in many respects, uh, the nature of our system that we have here in Canada, because education is controlled at the provincial level, provinces are doing different things, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, the, the needs of Nova Scotia are probably very different than the needs of Ontario or British Columbia or Alberta. And there's nothing wrong with those four provinces taking very different approaches to how they go about implementing distance education. Okay, you're not convinced, perhaps, that students uh, have a better or there's great opportunity or potential uh, to attract and retain learners. You don't think online learning, uh, that, that, that that is the way of the future, or, or perhaps you do. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think it has great potential for some students, the way it's being implemented. Um, it's not something that is appropriate for all students. Um, 
you know, if you look at the way online learning has been used traditionally, or well, even right now in Canada, yeah. and for that matter, the way it was traditionally used in the United States, typically it was used for your higher ability learners. You know, your your kids that are out in rural areas where it's difficult to attract, say, a high school chemistry teacher or a high school French teacher. And instead of having, you know, someone like me who took three courses in his first year of university in French yeah. um, teach the French course, we, you know, offer the French course online and then get a qualified teacher to teach it. Um, you know, those types of students have certain skills when it comes to learning. They tend to be more self-motivated. They tend to be more self-directed. They tend to be more independent in how they learn. Those students tend to do very well in online learning. Um, but now picture the same kind of, of opportunity for a student that, you know, is struggling to get by. You know, we're going to take the one source of local support that they have, that teacher, we're going to move them hundreds of kilometers away and expect them to have all of those independent learning skills and still succeed on their own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's not really a recipe for success, and, and we've seen that in the United States where you've got large numbers of students that do all of their schooling online. And these full-time programs actually tend to perform quite poorly in comparison to their brick-and-mortar counterparts, you know, the physical school. Yeah, okay. Also, he talked about, Dr. Bennett talked about teachers' unions and how they uh, have some reservations about online learning. They believe that we need to hold to the labor contract agreements which limit online learning. Uh, You don't feel that that's perhaps accurate, is that correct? No, um, if you look at unions across Canada, there are example after example of favorable responses to online learning. I mean, in all honesty, they they are consciously favorable because, you know, this is a new mode of teaching and learning, and we're not quite sure what exactly this means for uh, teachers. And and that's not just a concern of of unions. It should be a concern of everybody. You know, if you have, as a teacher, if you have the opportunity to teach in a classroom where you have some concept of, you know, what a school day is, constitutes, how much work is involved, when you have to do your grading, when you have to do your duty and stuff like that. And you compare that to, say, a an online environment where, you know, if a student emails you at 3 o'clock in the morning, yeah. they expect a response. Yeah. If we don't put some kind of limitations on what constitutes a school day for the online environment, what kind of teachers do you think we're going to get in our online environments, mm. the ones that can't get a job in, in the face-to-face environment because, you know, it's obviously a much more preferable situation. If you look actually in Nova Scotia, um, what they've got with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union contract I think is, is quite progressive. You know, there's clauses in there that talk about how this can't be just an add-on to the yeah. teacher's work day, that, you know, this has to be considered part of their load. Um, there's things there that talk about the specific types of support that schools have to provide online students because one of the things that we know is that the less able a student is, the more support they need from their local school. So you could have a teacher in Halifax teaching some kid up in Cape Breton online, but we can't just you know put that kid in Cape Breton in a room by themselves and expect them to learn. There needs to be some kind of support system for there, and the contract specifically speaks to that. It says that they need to have regular professional development above and beyond what a classroom teacher would get. Yeah, and, I, I think like anything, you get what you pay for. Yeah, I mean, and... You know, we haven't figured this out. Like, there are certain things I'll I'll admit that I I think that some of the unions don't really understand, you know, okay, what does this mean? And the BC Teachers Federation is probably a great example of this. You know, they've conducted more research into distance ed, the union has, Mm -hmm. than pretty much any other organization in Canada because they really want to get an understanding of, okay, what does this mean exactly? Right. I think what you're saying is is that the unions are viewing this not as, or perhaps they're, they've got their back up as some form of protectionism. That's that's not an accurate portrayal. No, no. I mean, like a lot of us, they're still trying to figure out, you know, what does this mean? And, and let's face it, I mean, the role of the teachers' union, like any other union, is to protect yeah. its members. You right. know, they want to make sure that those teachers that teach online have, you know, an equitable workload and an equitable quality of life to those that teach face-to-face. What does that mean for an online teacher? We're probably not really sure yet, but all of the unions seem to be willing to at least have the conversation about, okay, what does this actually mean for an online teacher? Okay. So what's the future here moving forward? Some type of hybrid of online and bricks and mortar? Um, Possibly. I mean, I think there are some students that, in all honesty, online learning is just not suitable for them. Um, You know, they just, they need that face-to-face support. 
and that's just how they're going to learn. There are some other students that, in all honesty, probably need very little of that face-to-face -face support. I mean, we all know that, particularly, you know, the teachers out there, we all know that kid that you could have just handed the textbook and yeah. say, okay, in 10 months' time, you're going to be tested on this, yeah. and they would do fine. Right. So that kind of kid probably would have a lot more opportunity to learn online and then there's going to be a lot in the middle that are going to need a little bit of both yeah. and I honestly think that that's kind of where we're heading but you know this idea that everyone should be heading in that direction because somehow today's generation or you know these technically savvy digital learners I think is a misnomer okay uh, your information your publication anywhere that people can go online to see some of this stuff um, yes, the reports that we produce annually, um, and we've got four of them up there now, are all available at the uh, International Association for K-12 Online Learning, which is available at www.inacol.org. Okay. And if you just click on the research link there, actually most of the information you'll see is based on the American context because it is an international organization that has about two-thirds of its membership from the U.S., uh, but all four Canadian reports are there, as well a couple of recent international reports, so you get a good sense of how Canada is doing in comparison to about 60 other countries. Okay, Michael, just one last question for you. It just occurred to me. Last week we had a call-in discussion with our, with our callers about inclusion in schools, full inclusion, and we had some varying ideas. Uh, any thoughts that you'd like to share with us on full inclusion? Um, well, I'll be honest with you, it's probably a little bit beyond my area of expertise, although mm -hmm. I should note that one of the areas that we're starting to see a lot of research in, particularly in the United States, is the ability of online and blended learning as a way of providing additional supports for students that have special needs. Um, you know, so, and there are certain students, uh, one that gets used, to, the example that gets used a lot in the U.S. is students that are autistic or have Asperger's syndrome. Yeah. You know, online learning for a lot of these students that uh, you just have difficulties, you know, sitting in a desk in rows with the teacher in the front and that, you know, that kind of situation can really be a, a godsend for that kind of student and provide a real opportunity for them. Um, you know, so in that discussion of, you know, how do we provide education for a wider range of students, um, I think the use of online tools has to be part of the conversation. Okay. Michael, thanks for taking the time today. Not a problem. It was a pleasure being here. All right. Michael Barber, Assistant Professor of Instructional Technology Education Evaluation and Research at Wayne State University, which is in uh, across the river uh, from Detroit, interestingly enough.